Hello, my name is Amy Pereira and I am a photo editor and I'm currently the director of photography at uh, msnbc.com in New York. And for those of you who aren't familiar with what that is, um, MSNBC is a news media um, network, primarily television, and um, I guess you could compare it to CNN. So that's who our competitor is. So I was brought in to um, MSNBC by our executive editor to launch a brand new photography department from the ground up to establish a visual identity and direction for the new digital platform. So I started there in 2013. Today, we are a small team of photo editors working very hard to create a home for documentary photography and visual storytelling. Our stories and projects tend to have a strong emphasis on issues um, surrounding social justice. So everything from race to income inequality, the environment, gender, reproductive rights. We produce photo essays and features, long form multimedia, um, all sorts of projects including yeah, video and also growing a robust social media presence. Uh, I started my career in print at Newsweek magazine, and I'm going to show you some, uh, some of that work, and then I'm going to move on to three digital projects that I've made at MSNBC. First will be Geography of Poverty by Matt Black. The second will be Continental Drift, which is in partnership with the Magnum, with Magnum Photos. And the third will be Political Theater by Mark Peterson. So I started my career in print at Newsweek um, in 2000, where I was photo editor on the international edition of the magazine for 11 years. As it turns, turns out, my career spans an interesting period, not only in world events, but also in journalism. I arrived at Newsweek with the controversial presidential election of George W. Bush. Shortly after came the attacks on September 11th, the occupation of Afghanistan, and the war in Iraq, and the so-called war on, global, on terror. There were tsunamis and earthquakes and hurricanes and wars in Lebanon, Sri Lanka, Congo, Somalia, and a genocide in Darfur. The global financial crisis hit and then the historic election of Barack Obama and the revolutions in the Arab world. These were definitely interesting times. Simultaneously, just a few years after starting at the magazine, the media as we knew it slowly began to awake to the seismic technological advances that were forcing profound shifts on how the world shared information. Seemingly overnight, waiting to get your news from a magazine that was mailed to your home once a week felt very, very antiquated. And who knew that that social network college kids were using would mature into the dominant vehicle for disseminating news and information across the globe to billions of people. Couple this with the collapse of the economy and the Great Recession, and it was a perfect storm of events that would force journalists and big media companies to change course and try to right a sinking ship. Declining newsstand sales and a business model reliant on advertising dollars that were drying up Legacy media, and specifically print-first publications, were forced to make drastic budget cuts, and with it came mass layoffs. The photo department at Newsweek alone had 44 people on staff in 2003, and by the time I left in 2011, there were just seven. So these were confusing and dark times across the industry. Many well-established leg uh, legacy media companies were forced to sell their brands, as was the case with Newsweek, or shut down entirely while others carried on struggling to navigate unclear paths ahead. Over the past few years, though, in many ways, we've begun to emerge from this darkness. The identity crisis of the 2000s forced us to dream up solutions and adapt. There is room for optimism. There is things are changing so quickly, and embracing the shifting tides is absolutely crucial. The old paradigms of how information is distributed and the role that journalists play in, this, in that structure have broken down entirely. Every day new tools and platforms are being developed. There are new mediums to experiment with and new audiences to engage with. As a result, and out of necessity, many journalists, reporters, editors, and photographers have moved on to independent models for publishing on blogs, digital first new media sites, and onto social media directly. We are less reliant on big media corporations to publish and distribute content now because we can do it ourselves. That's not to ignore some of the glaringly obvious problems we have. As an industry, we are facing, you know, how to pay for producing costly original reported content in a way that is sustainable and how to distribute that in a way that makes sense. So 
So I don't have all the answers any more than most, but evolution is a process, and solutions will emerge with creativity, tenacity, and ingenuity. We just have to keep working at it. So how I work has changed significantly since I started photo editing 16 years ago. Long gone are the days of photographers out in the field flying film back to New York in a pouch from some far off uh, conflict. And editing film and having an in-house lab make prints is a relic of, a, of the past for most of us. I haven't a clue where my loop is. I don't know, collecting dust or something. But I did catch the tail end of an old way and I'm so grateful that I came up during that time. But I'm also really excited about the next wave and the next wave after that. When I made the transition from print to digital, I had to take those years of experience and parlay it into something new. Based purely on instinct, it seemed obvious to me that I could simply apply the same principles I employed at Newsweek, hire serious, talented photojournalists and documentary photographers, uh, and tell stories from around the world and pay them professional rates to publish it in a digital platform. But as it turns out, people are way more accustomed, or they were, to getting free pictures off of Google and seeing surfing dogs on the internet than they were to engaging with serious reportage. It was a bit of a learning curve for me as well, getting up to speed with the seemingly important task of so-called getting clicks and producing viral content. For them, it was a learning curve, as I spent the first few years working in digital, fighting for quality photographic content and proper pay for professional photographers. Shifting attitudes and habits, as it turns out, is half the battle. Social media was also something I never thought about in terms of my work, and over the years has become integral and almost crucial to how I work now. We have grown an MSNBC photo social media presence on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as both a way to promote stories we make on msnbc.com, but also as an extension of the editorial work we do, where we actually make unique content specifically for social. As people grow less and less accustomed to going directly to publishers' home pages, and more and more reliant on getting content directly from social media feeds, we have to adjust. So I'm gonna show you now um, a project by photographer. The name of the project is Geography of Poverty. And uh, two years ago, photographer Matt Black approached me about a project he was starting where he wanted to travel all over the United States chronicling life in America's poorest and most forgotten places. He had done extensive research and compiled census data from hundreds of towns and cities and communities across the country struggling under the weight of often crippling poverty. Fifty years after President Lyndon Johnson declared the so-called war on poverty, more than 45 million people are still living under the poverty line in the wealthiest nation on earth. So Matt proposed a journey across America from coast to coast and border to border, visiting more than 100 cities and towns connected by the simple fact that more than 20% of their residents fall below the poverty line. We started the project on social media. He started the project on social media, posting regular dispatches with poverty stats and geographical information from California's Central Valley, where he's from. From there, he would continue on following a route through the southwest, into the south, through Appalachia, Rust Belt, and into the northwest. Later, on subsequent, subsequent trips, he would travel through the heartland of the country as well. I loved the idea and thought the subject was obviously very important, and I really believed in Matt and his vision and commitment, so we worked for months to make it a reality. But with a small team of just one developer, one designer, myself, and our writer Tremaine Lee, and of course Matt, we put together a long-form feature presentation, which we published over the course of three months in five parts. We had an introduction that outlined the project and set the current situation in uh, historical context. And then we followed by four regional chapters. In the Southwest, we looked at immigration and economic policy. In the South, we looked at the tie between race and environmental injustices. The Northeast, we looked at the economic collapse in the Rust Belt and the effects on healthcare and education. And then in the Northwest, we get into Native American disputes and the uh, systemic oppression of the tribes. Uh, we are continuing on with additional chapters, as you see. Uh, this fall, we are d diving into new areas of the country and different themes, including gun violence and mass incarceration. Later, when Matt completes shooting the project, we'll also be doing a book and an exhibition. Next chapter will be published in a few weeks. So then I'm gonna show you a project that I worked on, that I'm currently working on um, with Magnum Photos called Continental Drift. 
Based on the success of Geography of Poverty, Magnum approached me with a very ambitious idea to shoot the global migrant crisis. This project was shot by 10 different Magnum photographers shooting stories from around the world over the course of about one year. We started with an introduction that places the current crisis in historical context using the photographs from Magnum's very vast and rich archives. Next, we moved on to Moises Saman, looking at migrants arriving in Europe. Then Alex Maioli, which you see here, in China, following the annual largest migration on Earth. Then Mark Power, looking at Jordan refugee camps. Then we have uh, Lorenzo Maloney at the gateway of African migration in <coughs> Libya. Then next will be Larry Towell, looking at Mexico's southern border. Matt Black will follow after that with the distribution of aid from the international humanitarian city in Dubai. And then he follows the, that aid to South Sudan. And then after that, we'll have Bika de Porter, who spent time with families all over Western Europe who were actually accepting in family, I mean, accepting in migrants to live with their families. Uh, then we'll have Michael Christopher Brown, who travels to the Marshall Islands, and he'll look at how the environmental crisis there is threatening the locals and will inevitably cause a uh, refugee crisis there. Um, then we have our final chapter, which we'll be publishing very soon, um, by Jerome Sassini, and it will be looking at the sanctuary cities in the United States. Then the last thing I'm going to uh, show you and leave you, which we can't seem to avoid these days, is um, the American election. I hired Mark Peterson to photograph pretty much all of our um, election coverage for the last two years. Um, and it's a continuation on a body of work that he titles Political Theater. And he's actually about to publish the book um, with Steidel as well. Basically, it's a social commentary on the political system and our electoral process, as well as the state of the United States today. Mark is shooting virtually all of our content and has been, has, we, because of that, we were able to create a very unique um, visual voice for our uh, politics at MSNBC. All right, and if this doesn't depress you enough, <laughs> <laughs> this will, uh, we will, we remain to see what the next month brings us, but hopefully it will um, all turn out well. All right, that's me done. Thank you. Thank you.